Hello learners, today we are learning a new play, it's titled Desire Under the Elms. This is a play written by the Irish American dramatist Eugene O'Neill. He is considered as one of 20th century's greatest writers and this play Desire Under the Elms is considered as an American classic. The play which was published in 1924 brings to stage the life of the Cabot family. Along with the play, Morning Becomes Electra, it represents one of O'Neill's attempts to place plot elements and themes of Greek tragedy in a rural New England setting. In this play, O'Neill uses the moral and the physical entanglements similar to Greek drama to express the complexities of family life. It is essentially a retelling of the myth of Phaedra, Hippolytus and Theseus. Now let us have a deep look at the play. Eugene O'Neill was the first to introduce into American drama techniques of realism. In this play we see him depict the modern man driven by material desires. Set in the 1850s at the height of the California gold rush on a New England farm in the United States of America, Desire Under the Elms dramatizes the story of the Cabot family. A play in three acts, it describes the tragedy of human condition resulting from greed, desire and revenge. He views the modern man as the victim of the ironies of life and believes that this situation is the essence of human tragedy. O'Neill's dedication to tragic drama seems to grow out of his recognition of a modern crisis, the clash between spirituality and the American way of life, that is the American's emphasis on material values. This aspect can be considered as the end result of American dream, the dream of material things. Following the same selfish greedy path as every country in the world, I sometimes think that the United States for this reason is the greatest failure the world has ever seen. This basic human instinct is a major theme of the play and O'Neill powerfully depicts this through the characters in his play. Now let us have a look at the major characters in this play. Ephraim Cabot, the father, is a hard-working and God-fearing man. His first two wives have died probably because of overwork in the farm. In the first act, we find that Ephraim Cabot abandons his farm and his three sons who hate him. The youngest son, Aben, steals the father's money and buys out his brothers Simon and Peter who are headed towards California in search of gold. Shortly after this Ephraim returns with his young new wife Abby. She gets the assurance from him that if she gives birth to a boy the farm will be hers. But Aben sees Abby as a threat to his desire of owning the farm. The second act describes the increasing hatred of Abby for her old husband since she has married him only to own the farm. However, Abby becomes pregnant by Aben. And the third act begins a year later with a party celebrating the birth of the new son. Abby lets Ephraim believe that the child is his, but she later kills the infant when she realizes her love for Aben and sees the baby as an obstacle between herself and Aben. Aben, enraged, turns Abby over to the sheriff, but in the final scene, he is convinced of her love and he accepts his share of blame for the crime. The young lovers are led to their punishment and all Ephraim is left alone in his farm. Thus, it is clear that all the characters are led by the desire 
to own the farm. Dear learners, now let us have a look at the life of Eugene O'Neill. Eugene O'Neill, as I have already told you, is considered as one of the greatest playwrights in American history. Through his experimental and emotionally probing dramas, he addressed the difficulties of human society. His plays are characterized by a deep psychological complexity. Born in a hotel on Broadway in 1888, Eugene O'Neill was the son of Ella Quillen and the actor James O'Neill. Eugene spent the first seven years of his life touring with his father's drama company. These years introduced O'Neill to the world of theatre and the difficulties of maintaining artistic integrity. His father, once a well-known Shakespearean, had taken a role in a lesser play for its sizable salary. O'Neill spent the next seven years receiving a strict Catholic education before attending a private secular school in Connecticut. Though a bright student, he was already caught up in a world of alcohol and prostitutes by the time he entered college. He eventually dropped out before finishing his first year at Princeton University. Though he would later enroll in a short class in playwriting at Harvard, this was the end of his formal education. After leaving Princeton, O'Neill moved to New York where he spent most of his time drinking and carousing with his older brother. In 1910, he fell in love with and married the first of his three wives, Kathleen Jenkins. Soon after, however, O'Neill left his wife for the adventures of traveling. In Honduras, he contracted malaria and returned to find Kathleen pregnant with his child. Without seeing the boy, Eugene O'Neill Jr., O'Neill went to Buenos Aires and later to England. In 1912, Kathleen filed for divorce. Illness forced O'Neill to return to his parents' home. At home, he was welcomed by a despondent father and a morphine-addicted mother. This mental turmoil influenced him to become a playwright. And in this play, we can find the many elements and nuances of family life also. O'Neill spent the next five years of his life working primarily on one act place and in 1918 he married Agnes Bolton and had two children Shane and Una and his play Beyond the Horizon which was published in 1920 captured the attention of American audiences. This play won him the first of his three Pulitzer Prizes. Many saw in his early work a first step towards a more serious American theatre. After that, O'Neill went into an incredibly productive period writing many of his greatest plays. The Emperor Jones, which was published in 1920, and Harry Abe, which was published in 1922, follows the life of two men through personal struggles and their search of identity. These two plays established O'Neill as a master of the craft. The times, however, were fraught with turmoil for him. Seeing the death of O'Neill's father, mother and brother, as well as the breakup of his marriage. However, he went on to create a number of penetrating and insightful views into family life and struggle. The play that we are learning today, it was also published after this traumatic period in his life. Desire Under the Elms, which was published in 1924, and Morning Becomes Electra, which was published in 1931, uses the moral elements of Greek drama to express the complexities of family life. During the 1930s and 1940s, 
O'Neill continued working on a cycle of plays and he completed nine plays at that time which would deal with the lives of a New England family, the same setting that we are also studying today. Concerned that they might be altered after his death, O'Neill eventually destroyed the manuscripts accidentally leaving behind only one, a touch of the poet. And O'Neill's final years were spent estranged from much of the literary community and his family as well. Though he was awarded the Nobel Prize in 1936, most of his later works were not produced until after his death. His failing health did not prevent him, however, from writing two of the greatest works the American stage has ever seen. The Iceman Cometh, a story of personal desperation and long day's journey into night. Both these plays offer a view into the difficult family life of his early years and are profound insights on into many of the darker questions of human existence. Produced posthumously, these were to be his greatest achievements. By the time of his death in 1953, O'Neill was considered one of the 20th century's greatest writers. Dear learners, you have already seen what happens in the play. Now let's have a look at the mythological elements in the play. This play is important mainly because of the way in which O'Neill deals with the Greek elements. In order to understand this aspect of the play, it is important to look at the greatest Greek tragedy. Sophocles' play Oedipus Rex is the most popular when we consider the theme of family and this play serves as an introduction to the themes of incest and Oedipal complex in this drama. Now let us look at the story of Oedipus. He was left at his birth by his parents as it was predicted that he will kill his father Laius and marry his mother Jocasta. After an unfortunate series of events that did happen according to the prediction and Oedipus became the king after his father. This story is a classical representation of the fight a father and a son have for the mother's love and the son's rebellion against the father. When we come to the play Desire in the Elms, we find those aspects on various levels. For instance, Aben has problems linked with the Oedipal complex in his life. Due to the fact that he has three maternal figures in his life, each dominating in her own time. Those include his mother, Abby and the prostitute Min. Though Min is a minor character and not that active during the course of the play, she is important to understand Aben's inner conflicts and struggles. She is the one to whom he goes when he needs to spend time with a woman and she in a way serves as a replacement for his maternal and sexual need until Abby arrives. Aben shares Min with his brothers and his father since all of them were once her lovers before him. He says that she may have been his and your and too, but she is mine now. His complex derives from the unconscious rivalry with his father for the love of his mother and is enlarged by the arrival of Abby. Both men strive for her, influencing Abin's inner conflict and his outer conflict presented by the hostile treatment of the father figure. He sees Ephraim as a rival and wants to eliminate him, ultimately rejecting him as a father. He sees Ephraim as a rival and wants to eliminate him, ultimately rejecting him as a father. 
Eben's inferiority to the mother and her strong influence over his life is what moves him on and shapes him into a man that he is. There is also the element of another Greek myth in the play. O'Neill's drama is analogous to the mythical connection Phaedra has with Hippolytus and his father Theseus. Phaedra is Theseus' second wife and soon after meets his son, she falls in love with him. However, Hippolytus rejects her love, making her seek revenge after him. She accuses him of raping her and Theseus, after hearing that, curses his son who later dies. By following the accounts of mythical heroes, O'Neill portrays the Cabot family in a similar way. The roles of Hippolytus, Phaedra and Theseus are taken by Aben, Abby and Ephraim. Abby is passionate about Aben who rejects her first attempts and is unaware that their love marks the end of their previous life. The opening of the plot is mythical as both stepmothers find their stepsons a threat to the father's property and they both hide their true emotions by hatred. Both the developments are swift and cannot be stopped. The drama's epilogue is similar to the myth. Ephraim is left alone and not before Aben's curse falls on him and Abi's son. Differences are rare and mark only their willingness to share love and the fact that it was Aben, not Ephraim, who cursed his son. Now, it's interesting to note that there is also another myth that is used in the play. This myth is that of the myth of Medea, who is infamous for murdering her children in order to take revenge on her husband, Jason, who left her for another. She had the choice whether or not she would murder them and she chooses to do so. Committing one of the greatest sins in Greek tragedy, killing someone of one's own blood. Just like her, Abby deliberately decided to make an innocent victim while ending her son's life. What is more, it is the same son who was supposed to secure her the position on the farm and in the family. Later, Aben curses her and this boy for being born in a similar way that Theseus cursed Hippolytus. Dear viewers, it is interesting to note that apart from the mythological elements in the play, there are also clear biblical elements. We also find elements of the Bible in the play be it in the treatment of the theme, the names of the character and the symbols used in the play. O'Neill says that desire in the elms is the tragedy of the possessive, the pitiful longing of man to build his own heaven here on earth by gluttoning his sense of power with ownership of land, people, money, but principally the land and other people's life. The isolated, lonely world of the farm is for Cabot a kind of promised land in which God blesses his faithful with prosperity but demands unconditional sacrifice. All of the characters on the farm have biblical names also. Peter, the leader of Christ's apostles, derives from the Greek Petros or rock. Simeon, one of the twelve tribes of Israel comes from the Hebrew Shem on which means God has heard. Aben, the shortened form of Ebenezer means stone of hope and recalls the stone monument erected by Samuel to commemorate the defeat of the Philistines. Abby references King David's wife Abigail of father's joy 
who is described in the book of Samuel as good in discretion and beautiful in form. And Ephraim, a son of Joseph and the Egyptian Potipharah, means fruitful in Hebrew. So from the names of the character itself, we can see that there are biblical influences. The theme of good versus evil is also depicted to a large extent in the play through many characters. Ephraim embraces the dark, dry, rocky terrain of his farm because he feels God's presence in the earth. He trusts that the hand of God is testing him to the limits of human endurance, both in his physical strength and his capacity for loneliness. This testing forms an integral part or thought of the biblical history. Dear viewers, I have already told you that O'Neill was responsible for introducing realism into American theatre. Now, let us have a look at elements of realism in the play Desire in the Elms. As we have already seen, Eugene O'Neill and his poetically titled plays were among the first to introduce realism into American theatre. Realism was earlier associated with Russian playwright Anton Chekhov, Norwegian playwright Henrik Ibsen, and Swedish playwright August Strindberg. However, if we look at the plays of o Eugene O'Neill, they were among the first to include speeches in vernacular American and involve characters on the fringes of the society. Most of his characters are the common, everyday people who constantly struggle to maintain their hopes and aspirations but ultimately slide into disillusionment and despair. O'Neill's poetic dialogue and insightful views into the lives of the characters held his work apart from the less sober playwriting of his times. In the play, Desire in the Elms, this aspect of realism is very clear. We find realism in the way he has treated the dialogues in the play. The characters speak the dialect of the New England area. They remain faithful to their background also. The play also deals with the phenomenon of gold rush in California in the United States of America in the 1850s. Through this, he looks at the way this phenomenon impacted the life of Americans. This is very realistically represented through the characters of Simeon and Peter. They succumb to the attraction of the material comforts that could result from the prospects of the phenomenon. Their activities are typical of a family accustomed to hard work. In a way, all these characters are driven by what drives the common everyday man of that time in America. Dear learners, now let us take a look at the important symbols and images used in the play Desire in the Elms. O'Neill deploys symbolic elements in the play to dramatize the disintegration of his character's life under psychological and social pressures. These characters struggle to improve their lives but ironically they have to lose their integrity and they are crushed in the mechanical and materialistic milieu surrounding them and thus their American dream changes to a nightmare. This aspect is powerfully represented by O'Neill through many elements in the play. For example, the significance of the elm tree. The action of the entire play takes place in and immediately 
outside of the Cabot farmhouse in New England in the year 1850. Two enormous elm trees are on each side of the house. They bend their trailing branches down over the roof. They appear to protect and at the same time subdue. There is a sinister maternity in their aspect, a crushing, jealous absorption. They have developed from their intimate contact with the life of man in the house an appalling humanness. They brood obsessively over the house. They are like exhausted women resting their sagging breast and hand and hair on its roof and when it rains their tears trickle down monotonously and rot on the shingles. This is an excerpt from O'Neill's setting description in the play and it is clear from this description that the elm tree is an integral part of the play. Elm trees called the trees of sleep usually stand for dark passion, intuition and maternal instincts. Its rigid structure and strength of will represent the spirit of the people fighting to the finish. It is interesting to note that stone and land also play an important part in the play. The stone when whole symbolized unity and when shattered it signified disemberment, psychic disintegration, infirmity, death and annihilation. Stones fallen from heaven serve to explain the origin of life. In the play for Ephraim Cabot, the rugged patriarch of desire under the elms, the heavy stones embedded deep within the landscape evoke an eternal, unrelenting God. O'Neill's characters recognize the elementary nature of stone as immovable, unbreakable and immortal as representative of endless toil. But their responses vary sharply. For Ephraim, they represent a path to salvation. For Aben, Simon and Peter, the stones Dear viewers, now let us also have a look at the tone and the many themes used in the play. As you have already seen, the play touches very realistically upon the human condition. It looks at the human tragedy that is a clear outcome of human desire. Just as the title hints, it is the desire that drives the human beings and it is the desire that leads the human beings into many actions like revenge. In short, the predominant tone of the play is tragic. When it comes to the themes of the play, we can see many. However, the central theme would be the various explorations of the theme of family. Epic in both length and emotional scope this is one of the plays of Eugene O'Neill that broke new ground in their explorations of sexuality, relationship and theatrical storytelling. In doing so, he also explores secondary themes relating to the corruptible power of both love and revenge and the complicated relationship between past and present. Another important theme is the human preoccupation with material comforts which is represented through the phenomenon of California gold rush and through the characters of Peter and Simeon and their wish to make it large. This is also seen to a large extent in the character of Ephraim Cabot and it has to be noted that Eugene O'Neill has critically looked at the concept of the American dream through the characters in the play. Each and every character in the play is driven by the desire of a thing. They do not give much importance to human values. The degeneration of spirituality and human values are depicted through this play. Even though we see many concerns in the play, 
it all represents the many psychological aspects of the human mind the major issues of family life and the many psychological intricacies in the relationships are dealt with by Eugene O'Neill in the play. Dear learners, today we had a look at the many aspects of the play Desire Under the Elms. I hope you had an interesting lesson today and I hope to see you in the next class. Thank you.